Okay, we're back. Uh, it's 1.40 on the nose. And for our second to last session, uh, it's called Living in a Post Third Party World, what data you should be collecting now and what you can be doing with it. That's a mouthful. Um, I'd like to welcome from Google Marketing Science team lead, Maritza Toro, and from InfoTrust lead data scientist, Pam Castrone. I probably said that wrong, sorry, Pam. <laughs> and lead <laughs> analyst engineer, Tyler Platt. Uh, Pam, I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Pat. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Like Pat said, my name is Pam Castro and I'm the data science team lead at InfoTrust. In today's session, we'll be hearing from two experts on the future of marketing without third party data, specifically what you can start doing now with your data to ease the transition to a post third party data world. Our goal is that whatever your own industry, you'll come away with something new, a new idea, strategy or a fresh perspective that you can apply to help your organization successfully navigate the changing privacy landscape. Here's the format that we'll be following for today's session. We'll begin by meeting our panelists, and then I'll kick off the conversation by asking questions that touch on some of the high level themes and trends that we should be thinking about. If you have questions for our panelists, feel free to submit them to the chat and we'll answer them at the end if we have time. Now to introduce the panel, we're joined by Maritza Toro, Marketing Science Lead at Google, and Tyler Blatt, Certified, Cl certified Cloud Architect at InfoTrust. Welcome. So to kick things off, Maritza, Tyler, do you mind telling us a little bit about your current role? Maritza, let's start with you. Sure, thanks, Pam. Um, so the marketing science team at Google is really a blend of data analysts, data scientists, and data engineers. And the reason why we brand ourselves as marketing science is because we're using that skill set to be hyper focused on driving marketing um, you know, outcomes. And so what we're really focusing on now is prototyping analytical solutions using Google marketing platform and cloud. And these solutions can span, you know, designing an analytical framework for adopting a new feature to designing a machine learning model. And right now we're investing a lot of time, especially in aggregate level modeling, I would say. Awesome. Tyler, can you tell us a little bit about your role? Yeah. So my name is Tyler Blatt. Uh, I'm an analytics engineer and cloud architect uh, at InfoTrust. Uh, what that means is essentially uh, everything engineering that goes along with analytics. So with, with my history at InfoTrust, I've done everything from front end tagging, TMS systems, data layers into building out data lakes, data warehouses, data marts, uh, doing the ETL that leads into visualization and, and even some ETL and data preparation that goes before uh, Pam's wonderful data science team takes over. So uh, we work with all parts of data throughout their journey, and I'll be touching on the data points throughout today. Great. Well, let's kick things off with a question about analytics data. To echo some of the previous speakers, changes in privacy regulations are giving, more, giving users more control over how their data is used. How does this change how you view first party data? Tyler, let's start with you. So to get things started, the only thing that is certain about the future of digital analytics is that it remains uncertain. Uh, it, it's definitely a vo volatile place right now. The death of the third party cookies in combination with privacy regulations have thrown analytics and marketing data into a flux and there's no one size fits all solution to the problem. However, it's one great starting point, and as we've heard in a couple of things today, uh, for, for this cookie-less world, is a strong first-party data set. And from our last session, we know that's handled really well with GA4. Uh, it does this very well. So to talk about GA4 a little bit from a different angle, you can think about each data point in GA4 as a piece of behavioral data with metadata data tied to it. So some kind of site interaction, and then there's just extra data tied onto that. So for example, when a user consents, that metadata might contain identical information like uh, user ID. Uh, but in the case of no consent, you simply have collected an anonymous behavioral data set. GA4 does this really elegantly with consent mode, which is currently in beta. Uh, this less rigid style of data collection allows you to be more agile with the logic that, uh, uh, that we apply to our analytical data sets. That's kind of gonna be one of my themes today is being agile in this space is really important. So what do I mean by uh, the agile nature of the event-based analytics model? 
essentially, uh, when you look at universal analytics or classic analytics before it and the trends, everything was about defining something. What's a page view? What's a transaction? What are UTMs? What are the, you have all these definitions, but when we go to the core of what analytics really is, it's some set of information like I defined and then some interaction with the site. And when you organize it in that event based model, it allows you to be a little more loose with what we consider. So let's build this really strong first party data set with all that we can legally collect now from a great relationship with the customer. And then we can apply analytics as we choose as we go forward. So that's what it kind of allows us to be a little bit more agile in the space. And we're not at the whim of, of those kind of definitions. So the question to get back to where we started was how does this change your view of first party data? So at first glance, the concept of personalized targeted data, uh, like going away or having less personalized targeted data due to the lack of consent seems alarming. But I view it personally as a way to look at analytics differently. That we can just look at it differently. I've heard this a few times today. Uh, performance is not at odds with privacy. Uh, I think it's a central theme. Um, and and it, it, it hits the nail on the head. So uh, the way that I'm looking at analytical data sets is on one hand, you have this massive behavioral data set that encompasses all your users and all the engagements. And then within that set, that large behavioral data set, there's a subset of consented users who have an open relationship with your brand and therefore are valuable marketing assets. These two data sets face different challenges, uh, especially as browser changes are coming into effect and legislation and such. Um, so it's important to understand these two classifications uh, of different data sets and how we can effectively advertise to them. Great, Maritza, what about for you? How does this view change your view of first party data? Sure, so I would say as Tyler notes, like there are many unknowns around the future state of activation and measurement in the digital ecosystem with all of the changes that are happening. So I would say the good news and for those who were able to attend the keynote, Sean mentioned that large scale testing is not a technical thing, right? It's a cultural thing. So just like we try new things in our personal life, um, like maybe you know completing a new hill with a steeper incline for my runners out there, successful organizations will continue to try new things and they'll continue to build and really develop that culture of experimentation. So what is a culture of experimentation? Obviously, there's more than one aspect to a culture of experimentation, but for me, I would say a key aspect is really having an everything is a test mentality. And that way of thinking can really help transform your business. One reason it can help transform your business, um, I believe, according to Google's estimate, uh, that at least 96% of experts' expected outcomes are proven wrong, right? So experimentation and testing controls that risk of 96% of what you expect being wrong and can really put you on a track to identify where there's opportunity. But I think it, it's really important to set expectations with testing that not all tests are gonna yield positive results. Um, I know recently Microsoft shared that about a third of their tests yield negative results, a third yield neutral results, and honestly, only a third of their tests yield positive results. This is really important to foster throughout your organization when using first party data, but even more broadly to promote innovation. So I would say personally, I was very lucky to start my career in data science with this philosophy, because when I was in graduate school, I saw departments that did not allow research studies that had negative results um, to kind of be approved by their, for you know, their degree completion. My department didn't think that way and, and it really helped me adopt that thinking where all findings are valuable, even negative ones, because it helps you reinvest your future efforts where on higher impact areas. So again, I would say during this unique time where we still have third party to third party cookies, we should be testing wherever possible, yes, with your first party data and automation. But I would say test more holistically with cookie-less approaches for activation such as contextual and extend your testing into measurement as well. So evaluate your attribution performance based off of a traditional MTA with an aggregate data approach, maybe a regression-based digital attribution. 
So again, I know we were talking about first party data, test with first party data, but just keep testing wherever you can. Awesome. So I think what I'm hearing from the two of you is that there are two mindset shifts that are actually underway right now. As Maritza described, we need to adopt a culture of testing that goes beyond just site optimizations. Um, and from Tyler, thinking about analytics data is actually being two data sets, all users, and then that subset of users who have actually consented. So let's talk for a moment about that data set of all users. Um, how should we be think how should we be thinking about advertising for those users who have not given consent? Tyler, let's start with you. I'll jump in on this one. So uh, without consent, what do we lose here? We lose those one to one personalized targeted ads that everyone's used to. And that's really like that's been the MO for a few years. Everyone's about like, we got to get this data, we got to get it attributed, we have to get their IDs, we got to target back out to them. So we're we're everyone's sort of freaking out, but Advertising without one-to-one -one personalization is not a new concept. Uh, this was the world for a very long time, but it's kind of fallen behind in recent years because the, the effectiveness of those one-to-one -one ads is, is very good so that it's become the focus. But as we return, what's old is new again, and uh, we're, we're returning to some old concepts. So for example, contextual advertising does not require any consent to be effective. I mean, we've heard this a little bit earlier today when we were talking about activation uh, and, and the different strategies that we... Uh, we had presented today. Uh, but uh, to, to give an idea, it, creating an effective measurement plan for your contextual advertising is w would be key to transitioning into this new marketing ecosystem. Uh, like measuring traffic driven metrics like click through rates or cost per click are great, but using analytics to measure campaign conversion metrics to help inform buying decisions is even better. And then while thinking of it differently, right? So while a campaign might not be driving purchases, this, the, this contextual campaign might lead to user sign-ins, which allows you to engage that customer in remarketing because now they've consented and, and engaged with your brand. So make sure you have an effective measurement strategy for these different types of cookie-less uh, attributions and cookie-less uh, um, uh, advertising so you can understand the role all these channels are playing and what value it's bringing so then you can analyze and improve that system as a whole. Measuring this correctly helps us understand what content's driving us to a better relationship with the customer. And that's really the ultimate goal, right? Um, one other thing to, to talk about, one thing that I've been thinking on quite a bit, and this is 100% in the vein of Maritza's culture of testing, is what's the proper way to approach future marketing techniques or past marketing techniques that are coming back uh, with, that are while we're currently have these like large returns from personalized ads while we still can, like there's a, we can predict with a reasonable bit of certainty that uh, targeting is going to shrink when third party cookies are removed uh, or at least that personalized one-to-one -one targeting, right? Um, maybe not targeting as a whole. And if a company right now is seeing large returns from these ads, they'll be the most vulnerable for, for losing that, those large returns. But also if they cut the money while they can get it now, they're losing out on potential money testing a solution. So how do you embrace that culture of testing? How do you uh, go, you wanna go into this new world with some sense of certainty uh, without losing out on too much? And th th that's a, uh, an interesting problem to think about in the current landscape. Absolutely, Maritza, what are your thoughts? Yes, I know we've been talking and uh, a lot and the industry has been talking a lot about the expectation that segments of targeted users will begin to shift in size. And that's a you know expectation that makes sense. And we're probably already seeing that in some places. But let's also consider the case where an advertiser has limitations, maybe on like the percent of sales tracked at the one-to-one -one level. Perhaps because sales are occurring through a distributor. Think of a Pixel phone being sold by Best Buy, right? So I would say one interesting use case we've been testing with um, is really leveraging aggregate website behavioral signals. And, and Tyler was talking a lot about the behavioral signals and their value. So how do we use aggregated website behavioral signals to understand significant um, drivers of sales? So one testing example um, that we've done very recently is we took total daily unit sales as a proxy to individual sales, right? Breaking that one-to-one -one, um, level for the activation. And we joined those total daily unit sales with total event completions. And right now we were using Google Analytics 360, um, still learning before going into GA4. 
And so a total event completion, an example could be the total number of video views with more than 50% view through. Um, or it could be total visits to find a location page if you're a retailer. And so we identified the top three positive behavioral signals to test in what we're saying or how we would explain an advanced first party bidding strategy. And so if you're already using auto bidding based on like a floodlight activity, that could perhaps be your control cell. And then you can design a custom bidding test cell um, with something even as simple as taking those three signals and giving them equal weighting and learn from there. And so doing these customized bidding strategies, early results have shown really strong um, you know, performance and we're really excited to continue and test and learn around this strategy. But not only because smart bidding is a durable activation approach for the future, but also um, Isaac had mentioned in the last session around a strategy for testing GA4, as I mentioned, this specific use case, we were still in um, Google Analytics 360, but it's a good strategy to start doing your dual tagging and getting ready for the GA4 event-based level data that will be where we're moving towards in the future. Awesome. One other point I'd like to make on that before we move on, uh, just thinking about the, the, the system as a whole, this doesn't necessarily have to do with advertising as much, but... Um, Essentially, uh, when we're looking at this group of non-consented users, what that actually is, is we, uh, I talked earlier about segmenting the data and you have uh, the, the, that's one subset and the other subset would be consented users. And one thing that I think people need to be thinking about um, is analyzing those sets for behavior of what's potentially driving consent, what's potentially driving logins, what's potentially causing that to not happen. Are there traps on your website that are keeping people from logging in? Are there things stopping people from engaging? And those subsets are worth looking in. So in, in, in the spirit of testing, testing everything, not just uh, first party, but you know, and even this could be considered that, but let's run a multivariate optim optimized test to find out, could different language drive consent? Could we have a better customer engagement if we alter that language? Can I work with my legal team to get five copies of what this looks like and then potentially have different opt-ins and see if we can drive more users? Can I figure out ways to drive more users to log in and engage with my brand? And uh, the, the, the closing on that thought, in my opinion, privacy regulations are just a great catalyst for improving customer relationships. This is something that should have been happening to begin with, but now it's just a catalyst. And if we look at analytics as an opportunity uh, in this space, it's a great mindset to move forward and just really engage with customers better. So building on that um, and your ideas, Tyler, about optimizing, getting users to consent, let's talk about them. What are you seeing in terms of one-to-one -one personalized advertising for those users who have given their consent? Yeah, so the death of the third-party cookie meant the death of cookie match tables. This means personalized ads are going to change as we know them. Right. And uh, if you're not sure what a cookie match table is doing, you're not alone. A lot of people have no idea what's going on with third party cookies. So you're you're right there with them. But essentially, what they allowed advertisers to do was match customers advertising IDs. It's a little bit about Lauren was talking about in the activation phase on how that doesn't work anymore. They allowed it to attach different IDs so that you could advertise in different places. And without 30 part, third party cookies, 30 party cookies, that's a big, big difference. Third party cookies, uh, that system is largely broken. Um, so with match tables being like one of the main activators on how that entire ecosystem was working, the industry is kind of scrambling to figure out how are we going to activate users? What are we going to do for activation and what is personalization or, or targeted one-to-one -one personalization look like, right? Um, one thing, and we've heard about this today, so I won't go too far into this, that people are trying, and this is an example of the industry adapting. This is not something that's existed, but something that is uh, sort of new and a new take on this is the flock and fledge proposals, which are using cohorts as an alternative to the cookie-based targeting system. It allows users to be placed in a groups. Uh, this allows the user to remain basically anonymous in this while the advertisers can target based off the cohort as a whole, and then those can be improved. So that's an interesting one. Uh, one of the more popular ones is kind of growing at the moment, uh, alternate IDs, which is a less new style of targeting. So an alternate ID is essentially a way of looking up who is this user to you based off of some um, PII information. So you can take uh, from another one of the previous section, 
sections today, uh, Google's customer match works when you want to take, you have your offline customer data. You don't know how to advertise to them. Maybe they logged in at the store and they signed up for an email list, but I don't know who they are to reach out to them on the web. So what the way that customer match essentially works is for users who have opted in for this to be, they've, they've consented from the Google side. Uh, you essentially can reach out to any logged in Google person on their Google accounts to, to activate them on YouTube and places like this and start showing them ads. Now, this is a little bit of a step away from customer match, but it's a similar style of technique you're seeing with companies like LiveRamp. And they're doing the same thing, but it's not specific to the Google ecosystem. This gets a little more invasive and the jury's still out on what this is. So uh, LiveRamp themselves have this map of customer information that looks very similar to cookie match tables. So you can still activate on all these different platforms. Um, and you're essentially looking up the same way with PII information. But uh, like I said, I would say the jury's still out on if that's as invasive as third-party cookies. And if going that avenue might hold a little bit more risk because if something, if that's then seen as the next problem, they could be acts like third-party cookies. So, um, uh, uh, the, take that with a grain of salt when going through those options. And then the, the last one that I'll touch on today, which there are a few more, but uh, in, the, in the sake of brevity, uh, a lot of companies are starting to build their own CDPs. So if that customer comes with their ad ID from some pixel or something on your website, there's no reason that you can't store it yourself. So uh, you can think of this in the way that a lot with Google Analytics, we store client ID as a use of activation in a lot of GMP places. Um, uh, essentially, build your own first party data set. That's been a huge piece today that I've talked about. The one piece that's really interesting when I think about building out your own CDP is the need for building your own CDP is coming at the time uh, that server-side tag management's taken off. So all this, all this data is flowing through your cloud. Just drop it off while it's on its way. Uh, it, it's it's coming through and it's it's right there. So uh, that's a lot to digest. There's a lot of different things moving, and you do. Which one do I pick? What do I do? Um, it goes back to what I'm talking about. Let's be agile. Let's let's understand that we can move in this industry and we've collected the right first party data so that we can act on all of these options. And then we can test them. Let's go back to testing. We, we want to be able to try lots of different things. We want to be able to test and then even be agile in our responses to those tests. Um, so uh, and, and all in all for that section, lots of options, uh, but just be ready to try things out. Awesome. So I think... An interesting call out here in our discussion is that the changes Safari has already made as part of ITP, that with those changes, it's been possible to see some of the impact already. And so a question uh, to you, Maritza, can you tell us about your experience with clients you've worked with who've already seen the impact of ITP? Yes, so true, Pam. Brands have seen impact already. And we've actually been really inspired by the culture of experimentation of these brands who we would say are early adopters of that mantra, performance is not at its odds with privacy. And so these early adopters, I would say were significantly impacted by ITP. And so what does significantly impacted mean? I would say a large share of their website traffic was coming from Safari upwards of 50%. And so they began testing in 2018. And that's why we're saying they're early adopters. Um, and, and it's a good example of Tyler, you know, reminding us that we need to be agile because a privacy journey uh, really needs to involve testing multiple activation and measurement strategies, not just one approach. And so let me share an example of a privacy journey based on some of the early adopters. So Tyler mentioned this. Um, for activation, wherever possible, grow your relationship with the customer. Invest in your direct-to-customer data capture. It's going to grow the value of your first-party data, and it's very, very important. Um, in the example I gave earlier, a lot of these early adopters are already using first-party data signals to inform their bidding strategies. Um, they're also, though, using audience expansion. And so why are they using audience expansion to help test the shift of remarketing budgets to prospecting budgets and seeing how that performance um, compares. And so around audience expansion, there's so many testing options and that's with first party data or without first party data. But let's talk about, um, you know, one big area where testing, you know, can be agile is around that composition of your seed list. And so in the case of using first-party data, let's say you build a propensity model. 
Um, and so you want to analyze those model scores and those model scores are going to tell you how likely a user is to complete a conversion event of interest, whatever conversion event that is that's relevant to your business. And so you take those model scores and you're going to rank order the users and you can create groups. Let's say you create typically 10 ordered groups with group one having the highest scored users. So one example of testing is why don't I take the top 30% groups one, two, and three and see how that seed list performs um, when you add on audience expansion. Or you can test using the top 50% and then different levels of, again, audience expansion. But as data scientists, we know every model makes prediction errors. And these errors typically start to increase after the top 30%. So what's really interesting is I've seen better performance taking, let's say, everyone in the top three groups, then becoming much more surgical and only taking X number, like maybe the first thousand users scored in group four, not all users in group four, then take the first thousand users um, scored in group five, not all users in group five, and kind of create this composite um, seed list to then do your audience expansion. So interestingly enough, this idea came from a marketing partner. I was jealous. I did not come up with this idea. Um, they had expertise in break-even analysis with direct mail. So they leveraged that you know, strategic learning and brought it over into the digital ecosystem. I thought it was brilliant. Again, just a reminder, everything is a test. Um, Pam, I think, did you, did we want to kind of, with timing, pivot? Sorry to ask. Yes, let's just pivot to closing thoughts um, since we have about four minutes left. Um, can you share with us what are your recommendations for things organizations can start doing now? I would start with you. Yeah, so in the in the sense of brevity, I won't go too long on all of these, but uh, essentially set yourself up for success with a first party data set. If you've been listening to today, you've heard that a hundred times. It's what you got to do. <laughs> it's one of the most important things. Um, systems like GA4, handling consent for you, natural export to BigQuery, you own the data set once it's in BigQuery. These are just really strong. So start start looking at it that way um, and learning to see your data for what it is. Consent is an opportunity to improve customer engagement. Viewing and consuming the data in the segments that they are, so consented users, all users and behavioral, non-consented users, what is the purpose and what can I learn from these data sets and their communication with each other? It's really important to know what your data is telling you. Uh, embrace an agile development cycle and react to the market. So you need to be quick and moving and react to what's going on. Let's cast a wide neck. Um, uh, something that Sean said this morning that's just so true in the keynote. Don't be afraid to fail. Okay, like we got to try these things out. We got to be able to test and know I would much rather, this is my quote, so I'm not putting words in Sean's mouth. I would much rather fail than never find the right answer. I want to find the right thing that's from it. I want to test things and find out the solution we should be doing. And it's okay to try things out. Not every test is going to be perfect, but as long as we're embracing this culture of constantly improving, we know that we're going to be successful. Those are my takeaways. Awesome. And final thoughts from you, Maritza. Sure. And Tyler, I love that. Much rather fail and truth seek to find the right answer. Um, I would say, you know, we've been talking about user level data. We've relied on it for a long time but there's no need to panic. I know Tyler, you shared some, you know, tactical steps we can take right now. So I would like to close with a story. I'll make it quick. Um, it's not a personal story, but it's a story told in the movie Hidden Figures. If you've not yet seen the movie, I highly recommend it. Um, so Hidden Figures not only highlights the contributions of black female mathematicians to the US and NASA, there are actually a lot of other learnings there as well that are relevant for this moment in digital advertising. So Katherine Johnson, who's played by Taraji Henson in the movie, helped solve the measurement challenge of trajectory and landing for the very first human space flight. Again, the very first human space flight. So this means that the kickoff of that mission, the team had no idea how to determine the landing coordinates. This means there was no existing measurement strategy. So did this deter the US from continuing in the space race and doing something new, seeking that truth, Tyler? Absolutely not. Catherine identified that Euler's method, and we won't geek out on the math here, 
but it is a mathematical theorem that originated in 1768, first published. So to Tyler's point, everything old can still be new. <laughs> and so using that theorem, they were able to determine the coordinates and we had a successful um, first human space flight. We built out the space program. And I think it's just a very inspirational story that again highlights without prior technical expertise, we can still learn hard things. And most importantly, the math is there to solve any problem. So again, let's not panic. All right, well, uh, thank you so much to Tyler and Maritza for that insightful and lively panel. And so I think the takeaway, two takeaways from our session, test and don't panic. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Tyler. Thanks, Maritza. That was awesome. Um, you guys shared so much relevant and actionable information. That was great. Somehow you made me smarter yet feel so dumb at the same time. So, so well done there. Uh, before our last break, uh, in the chat box, you're going to see a uh, form. If you've been with us the whole way, this is your chance now to um, to register again for the chance to win the Peloton. So please go ahead and fill that out. And we'll be back in about uh, five minutes at 2.15 for closing remarks. And then we'll do the Peloton drawing uh, a little bit after that. So be right back. 